Hi, everybody. Today, I have the amazing pleasure of interviewing Laura Bitoyu. Hi, Laura. How are you? Hi, Ina. I am good. It's so good to be here and so nice to meet you face to face over Zoom. I know this is a real thrill for me. Like many people who are listening right now, I found you through Real. So it's amazing to get to talk to you face to face. And we're going to get into it. But first, can you share with everybody what is it that you do right now and who you serve right now? Absolutely. So right now I am working with business owners to streamline and simplify their Instagram reel strategy. And I do that through my reels membership. Awesome. And we're going to get into all of that, but I like to go back to the beginning uh, because when I see someone be as successful as you have been on Instagram, um, I want everybody to understand that you were not, you didn't come out of the womb with 70,000 followers. Yeah. <laughs> right? um, like we all start somewhere and I want to start way in the beginning. So yeah. I understand that your parents were entrepreneurs themselves, right? Yeah. So when I was born, my parents were doing um, logistics for like concert management. So this was when we were living in South Africa. So they have done concerts for like Tina Turner, Whitney Houston, um, the Rolling Stones, like all the big names um, in the 80s and 90s. They were behind bringing them to South Africa, which was super cool. Um, So, you know, growing up, seeing them as entrepreneurs, I like saw the difference in what their day looked like versus, you know, if I went to a friend's house after school, what their parents day looked like. And I knew That was what I wanted. Like, love that idea of that flexibility, that freedom of, you know, being able to take a break in the middle of the day to hang out with your kids, if that's what you wanted to do. Um, So I always knew I wanted to work for myself, but I had no idea in what capacity it was going to be. (laughs) But I'm going to ask you something. What you usually find is that kids kind of want to rebel against what their parents do. So how did you figure that you wanted to follow in their footsteps so badly? You know, it was a lot of trial and error. Um, I went to school for business, so I have a business degree. Um, My major was international business. And I mean, of all the majors you can pick, that was kind of like the fluffiest one because it's like, what do you do with an international business focus? So I did that and I really wasn't sure what I was going to do next. So um, after I finished my, my business degree, I was waitressing for a few years. I kind of worked my way up and was managing a restaurant for a bit. Um, I stopped that and went to law school for a year thinking I was going to be a lawyer and I did a summer internship and I realized very quickly that it was not what I wanted to do. I couldn't imagine being in an office all day. Like it just, it really freaked me out. So I was like, okay, I need something a little different. Um, so I left law school, went back to waitressing and managing at restaurants. Can we, can we pause? Cause like, there's so much right there that I it keeps going. Yeah. (laughs) I do not want you to like yada, yada, yada your way through like a very important part of your formation. So uh, when you graduate college, you said, you know, you went into waitressing and that you managed a restaurant. Tell me what was happening at the time. How did you land in that job? What were your feelings about that job at the time? So they call it the golden handcuffs for a reason, because when you're waitressing, you're making cash every single day. And it's, you almost have to be like a little bit of a gambler to like waitressing because you could leave with like $200 at the end of the night. You could leave with $800. You could leave with 40 bucks. You know what I mean? Like you have no idea. So part of that is like a thrill that I think kind of fed my entrepreneurial spirit because I knew like, okay, if I have a bigger section in the restaurant, I'm going to be way busier, but I'm also going to leave with more money. And, you know, if I can, um, you know, there's a couple of ladies and they're each having a glass of wine. If I can convince those ladies to share a bottle of wine, I'm going to make more money because people often tip on the total balance. Right. So little things like that, I could see my entrepreneurial wheels spinning, even while I was waitressing. What happened that made you go, okay, it's time to start applying for schools or was that like you always knew you were going to do something else and you were just waiting for the right time like what was the trigger that made you go okay it's time for that change let me apply it was FOMO like fear of missing out fear of being left behind because I'm looking around me at this point and like I have friends that are finishing master's degrees I have friends that are getting into medical school I have friends that are buying houses doing all these like big life milestones And I'm looking around and I'm like, I'm still here in the restaurant. So a hundred percent, it was like that fear of missing out, that fear of being left behind that I was like, crap, like I need to apply for law school. I'm going to apply for law school. Like I need to go to law school. I need to, you know, get myself together and I'm going to go to law school. At this point, what year are we talking about? So we can place ourselves in. Oh my goodness. It would have been 2015. 2015. Yeah. 
this is, you know, a few years, maybe seven years, yeah. eight years after uh, Facebook started. So, you know, Facebook is on its way. Amy yeah. Porterfield already has an award-winning podcast at that point, Online Marketing Made Easy. So like online marketing is already out there. Yeah. What role did social media play in your life at that time? Yeah. So at that time, you know, I had finished university in 2013 and we had done like a single course on digital marketing and we were learning about Twitter marketing. So like building your brand on Twitter, like that's how, like how long ago it was. Um, so at that point, the role it played was I was using it for, um, I was like volunteering for a nonprofit. So we were using Twitter there. Um, we use it on face for Facebook as we would use Facebook for the nonprofit as well. Sorry. Um, I was working with a friend and her online boutique and we were using a bit of Instagram and Facebook there. And then for the restaurant, we were using Instagram as well because Instagram is such a visual platform. So we were doing a lot of Instagram marketing for the restaurant and trying to get people in the doors by, you know, posting photos or like, we'll know about the sales we were having or the specials, the promotions. So at that point it was, um, not my main priority, but I definitely knew that it was like a tool that was helpful for the other, um, marketing efforts that I was focusing on. You get into law school. Yay. You're going to live the dream. What happened? Yeah. So I get into law school and I liked being in school. I think you know, the change of pace was really fun, a change of scenery, different focus, new friends. Um, I really liked that part of it. The social aspect was great. Um, I liked the content I was learning. I found it really interesting. Um, but I just, even like, you know, I'd wake up and I'm like, okay, I have to learn all this stuff. And then I was like, but what am I going to do with this? Like, what's, what's the next step? So that was kind of the first semester and I got through it. And then you know, the end of the second semester is when you start doing, you start like applying for jobs already. So I got the summer internship and I thought, okay, this is going to be amazing because it was like the dream firm. I was like, I've always wanted to work for them. Like I'd wanted to work for them for like six months, but I was like, this is my dream job. Like I can't wait to be there. So I like drive there. I'm dressed in my fancy outfit, get to the office and I'm like, oh, fun. And like, you know, the first day is like networking and like you have snacks and whatever. And I like that part. And then it's like, when you actually see what they're doing all day and what you're going to be doing all day. I was like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can do this. So um, at that point I was like, well, maybe there's other things I can do with the law degree. Like maybe I don't have to be a lawyer. And that's when I started thinking, do I really want to commit to all this time, all this money and, you know, not even necessarily using the law degree. Like, I don't know if that makes sense. So that's when I started to have second thoughts about, you know, being in law school and completing law school. So when you quit law school, what did you have going on at the time? And how did that structure your next step? I had absolutely nothing going on at the time. And I was like, I don't know what this means for me. So I went back to working at the restaurant, not sure like what was going to come of it. And I was kind of thinking I'm going to, you know, make some money and buy some time until I can figure out my next steps. And that's when I decided that I wanted to be an accountant. (laughs) Sounds great. Tell me more. Yeah. Right. Like, I don't know what I was thinking. So I was like, you know what, I'm going to do my CPA prep. So like the courses you do to start your, um, your accounting program. So I started that I did one semester of that. And, um, you know, it was like a month into it and my sister died. Yeah. So so I, yeah, thank you. I don't always talk about this, but I feel like for this, um, podcast, it makes sense. And for this story, it makes sense. And so, you know, here I am thinking, I'm going to be an accountant, struggling my way through these classes. My sister dies. And how old was she? Uh, so she was 23 when she died. What yes. was her name? Dakota. Yeah. So, ah, sorry, I'm getting emotional. Um, so, you know, her death was super unexpected. And it made me like completely shift my focus. And I was like, why am I going to school to do something I don't care about to make money, to buy things I don't need to impress people that, you know, I don't care about either. Right. So it was definitely a really big wake up call dealing with her death and the grief that came um, with that. So, you know, in a way it like forced me to like stop trying to do all the things because I feel like you know, when she was still alive, I was, you know, just trying everything. And I, I had this big void where I was like, what is everyone else doing? 
And how can I measure up to that? And after, you know, she passed away, my focus completely changed. And it was no longer about like, what's everyone else doing? What's going to impress other people? What do I need to be doing? It was more like, you know, taking a breath and thinking, okay, what's going to make me happy? And like, what can I do to make my life better? And to also positively impact the people around me, instead of thinking like, how am I going to impress people? It became like, how can I channel, um, you know, this energy into something good? There are a lot of people who are listening who have gone through something similar. Something has happened in their life, in their past, that has defined the way that they feel right now, the way that they show up in their business, what they decide to do in their next step. What is something that you could tell to everybody who's listening right now, going through maybe something just happened? Maybe they're not, they don't have the benefit of have being a few years separation from from what happened, maybe this just happened. What is the best advice that you can give them so they know how to move forward from this? Yeah, I mean, I it's so hard to even say to move forward from it because it's like, it's always with you. Um, You know, very early on, someone said to me, like, it doesn't get easier, but you get stronger. And I like hated that because I was like, no, it needs to get easier. Um, But you know what? Like, it doesn't, like, it's still really hard. I still have days where it's really hard, but I'm so much stronger and I'm better equipped to handle it. So you know, if you find yourself like in like rock bottom, the the worst things happened, um, you know, focusing on like that moment and getting through like one minute at a time, 10 seconds at a time. Um, because so often, you know, we're like, Oh, what's, what am I going to be doing? Like in a week, what am I going to do in a month? Like, how do I get there? And it's like, when something so traumatic happens, your biggest focus is like getting through the next five minutes. So I think, you know, breaking it right down and thinking like, how can I take care of myself in this moment and not putting pressure on yourself because, you know, especially for grief, I felt like there was a timeline and it was like, you know, after, you know, a month or two, I was like, oh, can I still talk about this? Like, are my friends going to be understanding? And then, you know, everyone talks about the one year like anniversary. And then I felt this pressure to be fine by one year. And like, I wasn't. So I think there can be a lot of external pressure, especially when you're going through something traumatic to like be fine and be over it. And it's like, that will never happen. And if you find yourself surrounded by people who put you on that timeline, like you need to get them out of your life because it's not, um, it's not healthy. So yeah, I mean, I think boiling it down is like taking it one step at a time, one moment at a time and just taking care of yourself however you can. So um, accounting, this happens, you are, at home, you're, you're struggling with this. Where did the idea, while well, you're going through this, where yeah. did the idea of, okay, maybe social media could be a thing? Like what was the spark? Yeah. So I um, took time off work because I like could not work. Um, so I think I took about three or four months off and like, I don't even remember those three or four months. Like it was a lot of therapy. It was a lot of like eating McDonald's in bed, like a blur. Um, and then eventually I started to kind of come out of my hole and I was like, what's next for me? Like, should I go back to work? And like, I would, you know, I went back to work maybe one or two days a week and I felt like I couldn't deal with it. Um, my brain was just so like, just so grief stricken that it was really hard for me to like go back into the groove of things at work. I was constantly forgetting things. I like had a really hard time maintaining high energy, which is so important when you're working in a restaurant, you're like customer facing, Um, And that's what I started to think, like, I can't do this. I need to do something where I don't have to be around people. I don't have to like put on a face and pretend I'm happy if I'm not. Um, And that's when I started to think like, what else can I do? So I had no idea what that looked like. Um, And I'm so grateful for my husband who was my, I think he was my fiance at that point. So he was like, you know, you were doing such a good job on the social media for the restaurant. Why don't you ask them if you can just do the social media and not do the serving and the waitressing and the managing and just do um, the social media and maybe they'll pay you for that separately. So I approached them and they were like, yep, that's fine. I had been doing the social media kind of like rolled up into my other duty. So I wasn't getting paid separately for it when I began, um, but they were like super supportive and they said, yep, absolutely. Like we will be your first client for that. So that was uh, my first client and I went along with that. And then, you know, from there it grew really organically because people would come into the restaurant and say, okay, who's doing your social? Who's doing your photos? Who did your website? Because I was doing everything at this point. And it grew really organically from there. People were talking, um, you know, word of mouth spreading, you know, who was working for them behind the scenes. And so I was able to get um, a few clients doing that. 
Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit because I want to start to get into your Instagram success, um, which is, you know, how I found you is just uh, happen to hop on a reel, beautiful girl doing amazing things. Like that's like, <laughs> it's like, that's like a recipe for like amazing reels and amazing uh, content and visibility. So I want to know where, first of all, like just before I get there, where did coaching come in? Because you could have totally stayed freelancing in fact you yeah. have an agency now you have employees you you serve clients as an agency but where did coaching come into your offering yeah so i was doing full social media management um when i started offering coaching and it was because people would approach me and say okay well i want to work with you but i can't afford to pay you you know two thousand dollars a month to actually run my account so how do i work with you so i would do like these pick my brain calls and i would charge i don't even remember like maybe fifty dollars for an hour like way under charging, way underpriced. And I would just do these calls with people and let them pick my brain on whatever they wanted for an hour. Yeah. yeah. And then how did that evolve into creating courses? Cause I, yeah, I care about everybody hearing this from you uh, because every single person who's listening right now and me included, we think that the way to go and make money online and to really like blow up is we need to have a course. We need to create a yes. course. We need the fastest route to a course. And, Everyone thinks that. Yeah. Right. And I loved the part of your story where you're like, the course came because I was scaling something that was growing. Totally. So when I first started coaching, it was like $50 an hour. It was like way too low. And I kept getting fully booked. So I was like, oh, okay, I need to increase my rate. I need to increase my rate. So I kept increasing my rates. And, you know, the last time I did a coaching call, it was $500 for an hour. And I still had demand. And I, I, I found that on the coaching calls, I'm saying the same thing over and over. So it's always like, okay, this is how you create a reel. These are the things you need to think about with the reel. This is how you find a trending sound. This is how to apply it to your niche. Um, this is how to set up your bio. I was saying the same things over and over. And I didn't think it was beneficial to the clients or to myself for them to pay that much to get that same information that I could have really easily put in a course and actually, you know, demonstrated better in a course because you don't have those time constraints, like the way you do on a coaching call. And it's hard in a coaching call. Maybe you don't have time to get a workbook out for them or like have them go through questions. So I found that because of the demand for the coaching calls, I was like, I'm going to make you know, a really quick, like mini course on reels on the same questions I'm being asked over and over again and make it way more accessible and, you know, put it out there and see what happens. Yeah. And I want to talk a little bit about your reels growth. Okay. Yeah. Now that we got that out of the way, because I wanted everybody to hear this, the course <laughs> is not where you start. The course no. is how you scale somebody, yeah. something that is working. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah. So let's talk about your re reels growth because I'm going to read some metrics here. You started your Instagram account, at least, you know, for this iteration of your business in 2018. Yeah. Um, in September of 2020, you had about 4,000 followers. In November of 2020, you had about 15,000 followers. Then March of 2021, this is like five months later, you were at 35,000. A year later, now here when we're recording this, you're about 68,000 followers. So this is something that seemed to have happened really quickly. And it was through the advent of Reels. Can you tell us that story? Absolutely. So when Reels were released in August of 2020, and I had a client at the time who was super excited about video content. She'd been on TikTok experimenting a little bit. So she was saying to me, um, figure out reels. Let's use reels. Like we need to go all in on reels. And I was like, Oh my goodness, I don't want to do this. I was thinking it's going to be, you know, get another feature that we get all excited for that doesn't really make a difference. So I was very, um, skeptical of reels and what they could do for your account, for your business. So this client was like, no, you need to make a reel just to figure it out for me. And then, you know, report back. So I was like, okay, I'm going to make some reels they're going to flop. And then I never have to make another reel again. This was like my game plan basically. So like we said at the time I had 4,000 followers and my first reel got 6,000 views very quickly. I would say like in less than a day. Um, so I was like, huh, this is crazy. Like I have written reels off. I, you know, my account was pretty small at the time and to see a piece of content get that much engagement and that much reach very quickly. I was like, this is different. So I was curious at this point, I was like, maybe I'm going to swap out my static content strategy and just make reels. And for me, I find reels are easier to make than like a carousel or a feed post or anything like that. So I was like, okay, I'm going to swap them out. So at this point I was making three reels a week and I did that for a month. And that is like when my account really blew up. 
I heard you say probably in the past six months or so, I heard you say that you used to batch your content with like two weeks in advance, but then you decided yeah. to change it to batching weekly because you were missing out on the trending sounds or something that you thought was a trend on Monday, but yeah. then you publish it two weeks later, it's not it's it anymore. What, what was your thought process in developing that strategy and honing in what was really working? Yeah. So, you know, we didn't really have a lot of information about how the Reels algorithm worked when it first got rolled out. So we're all kind of guessing at that point. Trending sounds were not a thing. Um, we didn't really know what to expect. A lot of the sounds I did in the beginning were just my own voice. So me talking, doing voiceovers, um, talking head style reels. And then, you know, I think probably a year ago is when they started to release more data about like how the reels algorithm actually works. And they emphasize the importance of using trending sounds and how there is a bit of an algorithmic favor to using those trending sounds. And because I'd been batching, you know, bi-weekly, I was like, okay, maybe I need to make that shift to doing it weekly now so I can take advantage of trending sounds. And especially because we're seeing, you know, now that the trends are over very quickly, whereas some of them last forever. So it's really hard to predict how a trend is going to last or how long a trend is going to last. And I think by recording them weekly, you give yourself a little more flexibility. You can be a little more agile with what you're recording and what you're posting. One of the biggest things that I have noticed is that we don't really know what is going to work when we post it, right? Yeah. When you post it, sometimes you post something that you think is just going to be, ah, oh, just whatever. And it blows up for some reason. <laughs> we don't yeah. really know why. Um, like gambling, so, yeah. <laughs> so for everybody who's listening, who maybe hasn't really put all their chips on reels and they're like, okay, you know, Laura says that it works. So what would be your biggest, let's say like three tips for people yeah. who have not really put their, thoughts into it, but they really should. What yeah. are the three things they should keep in mind before they start? Absolutely. So the first thing, you know, when you're starting out, you maybe don't have an idea of what you want to do, or you're not sure how to confidently communicate whatever it is you, you talk about or that you share. I would say head over to your Instagram insights and look at the content that has already performed really well for you. So, you know, looking at the content that gets the most comments, the most saves, the most shares, that's usually a really good indication of what your audience finds valuable and wants to see more of. So taking one of your static posts and repurposing that information into a reel, um, that's a really great place to start in terms of, you know, getting results, but also, you know, boosting your confidence a little bit because you know what you're talking about and you're not, you know, coming out of left field, testing a new topic. So I always recommend, um, you know, starting over there if you are new to reels or if you want to feel inspired with your reels. Um, you know, another thing I like to remind people of is like, you not every reel is going to go viral. Not every reel is going to, you know, even do well necessarily. So adjusting your expectations is really important as well. Um, and then, you know, getting your reps in and the, the more reels you create, like each reel is like a lottery ticket. Like the more you have, the better your chances of one of them going viral. So I think that's really important and get comfortable with, you know, not everything being a success as a type A or recovering perfectionist. Like that's something I struggle with, but I am getting better. Um, so I think adjusting our expectations is really important as well. Do you think that the growth is slowing down on Reels? Obviously, with any new uh, any new feature, if you're an early adopter, you're going to be rewarded for yeah. it. Now, here we are two years after Reels have been introduced. Is it too late to get in the game? Uh, you know, I don't think it's too late. So often people are pushing Reels as a way of growing your audience and like finding new people. I also think we need to talk about like leaning into your existing audience and connecting more deeply with them. Um, so that there's always that focus, like more and more and more, but it's like, what about leaning into the people that are there, the people that are already supporting you, the people that have already, you know, raised their hands and said, hi, I'm interested. I'm following you. So I think that little shift is also important to note. I don't think it's too late. Um, you know, if your goal is to go viral, it's definitely harder now than it was two years ago, just because of the sheer volume of what else is out there. Um, and of course it's gotten more competitive. People are like doing transitions, like through, you know, like a glass or like, you know what I mean? Like there's just so much more in terms of volume, but also like the bar is just so much higher now as well. So I think, yeah, it's harder, but it's not impossible and it's not too late. I love it that you said something that is really near and dear to my heart. So, um, I speak to my audience about monetizing small 
audiences. Number yeah. one, because I've always just stunk at growing an <laughs> audience, but apparently I'm, I'm a master at monetizing the small ones. Yeah. And what you just said is just such a key. Is um, I, I usually tell people, if I were to give you right now 10 followers, 10 more followers for your account, if you are unhappy about that, because thank you, Ina, what I really needed was 10,000, what am I supposed yeah. to do with this? That's not the right attitude. Well, yeah the other half of you are going to say, thank you. Let's talk to them. Let's see what yeah. they're up to. Like, I love hearing that, especially from an <laughs> audience growth expert that just made my day. Yay. So that's amazing. So glad. Um, <laughs> can I ask you just one more question? Yes. Reposting reels. Yeah. Have you, have you done it? Do you recommend it? Like if something didn't perform well three months ago, resurfacing it again, is that something people should even think about doing? You know, it depends on a few things. Like each reel is a little bit different. So if it's like a trending reel that didn't do well the first time, I wouldn't necessarily say, you know, copy, paste, repost that exact same reel. But maybe if there's a message in that reel that you want to try again with a different delivery, that's absolutely fine. Uh -huh. um, you know, previously I have reposted reels like word for word, like the same video, just reposted them. Um, those are more like evergreen content pieces. And those definitely you can repost. I had one the first time I posted it, it didn't do so great. The next time I posted it, it got way more views um, because there are so many factors that go into what make a real successful, like the time of day, the hashtags you're using, you know, your caption, there's so many different factors that can influence how a reel performs. So, you know, by reposting it, you are giving yourself a second chance to be successful, whatever that looks like for you. I like that. So yeah. if um, somebody's starting out with reels right now and they come and they have you audit they, and, and I'm sure you do this all the time. What is the one thing, just one, the one thing that people are doing way too much of, or they're doing it totally wrong. And you wish you could just shout from the rooftops. People need to stop doing this or do it better. What is that thing that people need to get through their head? I mean, this is a big thing, but people are not making it quick and snappy. So Often, even now, two years later, I still will scroll on the reels tab and I'll see someone hitting the record button and then getting into position like that dead space. People will scroll right away. You need to hook us in within the first second. Like I used to say three seconds. It is like a second. Now our attention spans have shrunk even more. So you need to hook someone in the first second, get to the point, let them know what they're going to get from watching your reel and then get to the point. Like you don't have to elaborate and, you know, beat around the bush about what your reel is going to be about. Love it. And that's exactly what we're all going to go do. So what do you think is the biggest misconception that people have of you as a successful businesswoman? Oh my goodness. I'm sure there's so many that I can think about. Um, I think people often will say to me like, oh, it seems like you're perfect and everything's so together. And I don't feel that way at all. And I, I feel guilty almost if that's how I come across, because I don't feel like I have my stuff together. I feel like I'm flying by the seat of my pants, like almost every single day. Um, so I think that's a big misconception and I, I don't want to feed into it. So I have been showing up in a way that feels a little more like imperfect lately. And I hope that that, um, shows people that I am like just a normal person. <laughs> Do you have like a really disciplined uh, way to like create your content and you yeah. only do it on Mondays between nine and 12 and then you're done and. I wish like I, it depends. Like I, yeah, I have ADHD. So I like struggle with that a little bit, or I try not to say I struggle with it. I live with that. Um, so that definitely impa impacts like how I create my content and how I show up on social media and in general. Um, I try to have a really good structure. Like I do try to record all my reels on a Monday, but sometimes they'll happen on a Thursday and that's okay too. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one thing about like my membership and like having um, like sourcing trending sounds constantly is that I always have them at my disposal, which does make my life a little bit easier when I do feel inspired to record. Um, and then also, you know, keeping in mind that trending sounds are lasting a little bit longer nowadays. So I don't feel the pressure like I used to. And I also think trend FOMO is something that I've stopped having because, you know, there's always a new trend. If you miss this trend, there will be a new trend tomorrow. So that's another thing, um, a little bit of a reshift or reframe that I've been uh, leaning into. Tell me a little about close friends, no filter. 
Absolutely. So me and two of my close friends started a podcast to talk about all things Instagram and social media marketing. We find that there's so much like gossip, rumors, myths. So we started this podcast to really cut through the noise and to give um, online marketers and people who are using social media for their business a really clear place to find um, the truth and, you know, how to approach social media with a very strategic and no BS approach. Can you do a shout out to your co-hosts? Absolutely. So Stephanie Gilbert is no longer um, a co-host with us, but she was with us for season one. And then we have Manu Mararo from your social team. And she's one of my co-hosts and I consider her my business mentor, even though she probably doesn't know that. Um, so she's amazing. And um, it's been really, really great to work with her on this. Well, we're definitely going to be putting their, um, their Instagram accounts down yes. below so everybody can go and follow. And so everybody should go right now, since you're listening to a podcast anyway, go and find Close Friends No Filter and subscribe to it right now. So if everybody who's listening had to do what you're about to tell them to do, and they have to do it in the next 24 hours, what would that thing be? Do the thing that you have been putting off. Like I, we all have that one thing where we're like, I need to launch a course or I need to do this or I need to, uh, you know, reach out to a friend. If there's something on your list that you've like been meaning to do, and we all know it's going to take you less than five minutes, like do the thing, take that first step towards doing something and just get it done. So this has been so lovely. You have been so open. This has been a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Really, thank you so much, Laura. Um, can you please tell us a little bit about your membership and where can people find you and follow you? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So my membership is called The Reels Report. We send out four ahead of the trend sounds every week for Instagram and for TikTok. And by doing that, we're giving you basically a game plan to show up on Instagram and TikTok every week very consistently for your business. And you can find me on Instagram at bsquared.social. Thank you so much for being here, Laura. It's been a pleasure. Yay. Thank you so much. So nice chatting with you.